by list. Okay. Uh, so we are live now. We can begin. We can? Yes. We are live? Okay. Welcome, everyone, to the first APOA Hand Up Limb webinar. Next slide. My name is uh, Ted Ma. I'm the professor at the College of Medicine and Public Health, uh, Flinders University of South Australia. I'm the president of the uh, inaugural, president of the APOA Hand Up Limb Society and therefore section. I welcome everyone who could join us for this historic webinar on common and complex fractures in shoulder, elbow and wrist. Historic because it is the inaugural webinar for the APOA Hand Up Limb section. The section was founded in May this year with foundation members from 15 countries within the Asia Pacific region. Tonight's webinar is the first of a series of webinars focused on education to cater for basic and advanced hand, elbow and shoulder surgeons. The three year webinar series is designed to provide a comprehensive teaching curriculum for surgeons interested in hand upper limb, as well as advanced technical skill series such as arthroscopic techniques and cadaveric components. In the first webinar, we'll be presenting the controversies in proximal humor fractures to fix or to replace. This is followed by a lecture on the principles of management on distal humor fractures by the famous Professor Sean O'Driscoll. The last sessions of the webinar will be on discussion on the controversy of management of undisplaced hyper fracture to treat it conservatively or with surgery. I'd like to thank Smith and Nephew Asia Pacific for sponsoring our first webinar. I'm sure we will all learn something new tonight from the experts. But before we proceed, I'd like to invite the APO president, Professor Mamadora, to give the webinar opening remarks and to introduce the Hand Up Lim uh, committee members. Professor Doro, please take over. Thank you so much, my dear friend, uh, Ted. This is the first webinar of your new section. It's my uh, great pleasure to say something at the beginning and uh, look at the uh, slide, please. Okay, uh, this is wonderful, Tim. Uh, you are the inaugural president. Uh, I know you uh, were at the same time one of the past president of APOA with your outstanding energy. And I am sure that you spent a lot of energy for, for this uh, section. And um, I thank to all of you, uh, to Professor John, he is the uh, president-elect from Korea, to Dr. Uh, Margaret Falk, she is a treasurer from Hong Kong, and uh, Dr. Aminata from Indo Indo Indonesia. Uh, he is the secretary gen general. Uh, to be a secretary general is not easy, but I am sure that you will be one of the best. Uh, uh, for the education, Professor Sun uh, from uh, Korea is another very important uh, committee. Uh, then uh, Professor Kolavish, he is the symposium uh, chair uh, from Thailand, another, another important uh, platform. Uh, slide, please. And the, uh, look at the, uh, the slide. Uh, WPOA start in 1962. Uh, at the time, the name was uh, West Pacific Orthopedic Association. Uh, uh, slide, please. Uh, one, okay, uh, but in uh, 2001, at the time of Professor Bose, the name is, uh, was expanded. Then uh, Asia Pacific Orthopedic Association uh, was, uh, start in 2000, with his name in 2001. Uh, nowadays we start uh, another mission uh, to be a federation at the same time. 
uh, slide, please. Look at this uh, slide. This is a big territory. Uh, we are a really big family. We have a greater uh, potential, the largest orth orthopedic association uh, with uh, more than 60,000 orthopedic uh, surgeons and uh, with 24 countries as a member of our federation. And do not forget that in this territory, there are more than 3 billion people live, people lives, and uh, more than 300,000 of orthopedic surgeons works in this area. Slide, please. And uh, we have three groups, uh, subspeciality uh, committee, standing committee, and uh, subcommittees. We have 10 uh, subspeciality committees, and you can see, and then, uh, upper limb section started with Ted Mach from Australia and we have six standing committees and uh, we have two subcommittees. Slide please. And alone we are strong. Together we are stronger. Do not forget this. This is a, one of the big picture photo uh, took in, uh, at the time of um, council uh, in October 14 in KL. And uh, in my right side, you can see your uh, president of your new uh, committee, of your new section, sorry. And do not forget uh, to follow 21st uh, APOA meeting, which will be held in KL if we can, if uh, COVID-19 gave the permission to us. On the other side, we can uh, make the Congress uh, virtually. Uh, have a, a good day, have a good works and big su uh, success. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Doro. Thank uh, you. The program Thank will you. now proceed with the uh, Proximal Humeral Fractures, uh, moderated by Kim and Sung. And I thank again, Smith and Nephew Asia Pacific for being the sponsor. Uh, Moon Sung, would you like to now take over? Okay. Hi everyone. Uh, I'm Myung Sung Kim from South Korea. First of all, congratulations on holding the first APOA Hand and Operating Society webinar. The first session is about the issues of fixation versus astroplasty in Proxima humerus fracture. We will have a discussion after all the speakers' presentations are finished. I would like to introduce the first speaker, Dr. Iman uh, Widya Aminara. He is the Secretary of Indonesian Shoulder Elbow Society, and also he is Shoulder and Elbow Surgeon uh, in the Pamawati National General Hospital in Jakarta. He is now the Secretary of APOA Hand and Prim Society. Uh, his topic is a fixation in proximal humerus fracture, please. And the second speaker is, uh, okay. Please, Thank Dr. Ina. Thank you, Professor Young san Kim. I would, would like to start my slide. So, this evening, I would like to talk about proximal humeral fractures, about uh, how I uh, will deal with the proximal humerus fractures. I will talk about uh, fixation. As we know that proximal humerus fractures has a B-modal peak of incidence. Usually it's uh, happen in uh, young active people, but also in elderly, it becomes the third most common fractures. Many surgeons consider proximal humerus fractures is a forgiving fractures. So the options may vary from conservative with the slings or internal fixation. You can do with wires, plate and screws, nails, even arthroplasty. There are factors that we need to consider before deciding what kind of treatment suitable for our patient. Most important are bone quality, comorbidities of the patient, and functional demand. The other important factor that we need to concern is about the vascularity of the humeral head. 
the most common uh, classification that we use for defining proximal humeral fractures is a near classification, which is uh, divide the proximal humerus into four parts, which is a humeral head, lesser tuberosity, greater tuberosity, and the shaft. We need, we will classify them as a separate part if there are one centimeter displacement, 45 degree angulation or excessive rotation. However, if we try to do a near classification, there is a poor inter and intra observer reliability, especially when we use uh, X-ray only. So it is considered will be more reliable if we have a CD scan to have a better understanding about the fractures pattern. If we talk about vascularity of the proximal humerus, it is considered that the main blood supply of the humeral head, it comes from the posterior humeral circumflex artery. And Hertel defined that medial calcar is a very important part that we need to pay attention. If we have a fractures of the medial calcar or comminution of the metaphysis, there will be high chance to have a AVN of the proximal humerus. However, it doesn't mean that if we have a positive Hertel criteria, we don't do fixation because Bessian in GSS 2008 already have a study that 80% of patients with ischemic head, if we classify based on Hertel criteria, then he do fixation. Uh, at the end, there is a little, uh, little number of patients that has a fast, uh, head collapse. It means that it's still worth it to do fixation. So what is my strategy when I have a proximal humerus fractures? First, we need to know our enemy. CD scan is very important. When we have a X-ray of the proximal humerus fractures, like in the slide, we tend to consider this is a benign fractures. This is a simple fractures non-displaced. If we want to do ORIF, it will be easy. However, if we take a look at the CT scan, we can find that the fracture pattern split the head. So this is not a good candidate for internal fixation. In proximal humerus fractures, I would like to have fixation as my first choice. We can do with percutaneous spinning, plate screw with locking or non-locking, or nail. However, we need to think about complication. There are non-union, malunion, hardware problems, the screw may care out, or AVN. When I do, fixation, I will use a deltopectoral approach. I use this one because this is a very extensile. We can do uh, good exposure. And what we need to be concerned is where we put our retractor. Because the blood supply comes from the medial part, I try to avoid putting Holman retractor on the medial side. I would like to use the Army Navy or Ragnar retractor. And for the lateral side, I try to also avoid putting Holman retractor too deep because it will may it will injure the axillary nerve. Second thing is where we need to aim the screws. CT scan studies of the proximal humerus show that in the anterior and the superior part of the humeral head, the bone density is less than the posterior and the central. Therefore, when I put my screw, I always aim the screws to the posterior or the central. We need to restore the normal anatomy parameter. We need to think what are the normal parameter. First thing is, the head summit should be higher than the GT. If we mal reduce it, the GT is higher than the head, it will be 
it will impinge. It will uh, make abduction of the humerus uh, block. Second thing is we need to restore the CCD or the neck humeral head angle. It should be about uh, 135 degree. The most common problem after, after we do fixation is we will have a varus collapse. This is because we have a very strong muscle pull in the proximal humerus because of the strong pull of the rotator cuff. We have to encounter this problem. So how can we avoid the varus collapse? Remember, when we have a proximal humerus fractures, the proximal humerus, usually the head is so spongy and the shaft of the humerus impacted to the uh, humeral head. So after we have a uh, good reduction, we, also, we will always have a big void in the humeral head. So this is a problem. If we just leave it like that, our screw purchase will not adequate and there will be a virus collapse. So how can I prevent virus collapse? There are several tips and tricks. I use uh, impaction grafting, you can take from the iliac crest, or use a fibular strut, or in very rare case, sometimes we need to use a double plate. The other thing we need to concern if when we do reduction, we better use a suture tag to the tendon. If we use a hard instrument, the fracture fragment usually is very thin and it will be comminuted or more fracture if we try to pull with the Heart instrument. So I recommend use a suture tag to the tendon and we can pull the fracture fragment. After have the reduction, we will need to incorporate those suture tag to the plate. In this way, we will transfer the pull, the pulling force of the tendon directly to the plate, not only to the head. So this is the way how I prevent the virus collapse. In this case, when the rotator cuff contract, it will pull the whole humeral head and the shaft together as a one block. Another proximal humerus fracture that we always encounter is about GT fracture. This is looks benign, but sometimes it's very tricky. I tend to classify it into two types. One is shear type, the second is avulsion type. In shear type, we will have a large one piece fragment. In this kind of fractures, we can do fixation whether with screws or plate because we have a big enough uh, fracture fragment. But sometimes we will encounter a small avulsion type or comminution type of GT fractures. In this case, if we put uh, screws, the fracture become more comminuted. So how we can fix it? I suggest we can use a transosseous sutures, whether you use a suture anchors, but this one will be more, uh, will be expensive, or you can use the simplest way with the transosseous sutures. And post-op, I always immobilize my patient in a sling for two or three weeks and start with pendulum exercise and shoulder shrug to avoid muscle stiffness. And after four weeks, I will start my patient with the table slide exercise. In summary, I always try to preserve the head. We need to do anatomic restoration of the proximal humerus and rotator cuff is the key to have a good reduction and prevent virus collapse. It is better to do acute fixation than late fixation. And we need to start early and protect that range of motion exercise. Thank you. Okay, thanks Dr. Iman. Uh, thanks Dr. Iman. Uh, let's move to the sec uh, second topic. Uh, I will introduce uh, Dr. Ashish Bob Herker. 
Uh, he is the founder president of a short and elbow society in India. And he performed the first reverse shoulder replacement in India in uh, May to, uh, 2010. Okay, his topic is arthroplasty in proximal humerus fracture. Dr. Ashishi, please. Thank you, uh, Dr. Mungsun Kim. And uh, indeed, it's a pleasure and privilege uh, for this first APOA hand and upper limb webinar. Looks like with the top excellent faculty, this is uh, going to be a historical uh, webinar. I'm really glad to be part of it. So it's a controversial topic, and that's why um, it requires a lot of detail. And I doubt we have a consensus amongst us all across the world. And each shoulder surgeon, you could divide, split them in half in those who believe in arthroplasty in proximal human fractures, such as hemiarthroplasty. Uh, and those who just prefer a reverse. Uh, that's why the Hemi got a lot of bad flack and bad press uh, because of the published literature as such, but I don't subscribe to that. So I'm going to give you my philosophy on uh, the proximal humerus fracture and Hemi arthroplasty. So firstly, we must make a clear distinction between fracture healing on proximal humerus fractures and the restoration of function. And that's not consistent across our patients, even in the best hands. A lot of proximal human fracture fixations don't get their perfect uh, function back again. And that must be said, uh, the same must be said about hemiarthroplasty in proximal human fracture. And because of the discrepancy in results, uh, hemiarthroplasty has become rapidly unpopular, uh, especially in the European world. So uh, why is that so? The first principle we need to understand is if a surgeon is able to restore the 3D architecture of the proximal humerus, then he's going to give them back the function. A lot of that 3D architecture is related to version and height restoration. And I'll, I'll like to speak a little detail on that in the latest part of the slides. But if we can achieve an anatomic tuberosity healing, the greater tuberosity, and largely that is a result of restoration of correct version and correct height, then we are likely to get a good result. A good rehab program is also very important. So you will see that units have, which have a reputed rehab program tend to do well. We must also remember that there's a clear distinction between treating fresh fractures with hemiarthroplasty and those that have been tried with a conservative program or a failed fixation. And so we are not comparing apples and oranges in that case. Firstly, uh, the hemiarthroplasty that is done for osteoarthritis and those that have been done for fractures is as different as chalk from cheese. In a trauma situation, we don't have landmarks. The biceps is an unreliable landmark. Uh, Murchowski's paper gave us the reference of pec major, but again, there are at least three papers that said that that's a soft tissue landmark and that's largely variable between patients. Version, most of us were taught that we have to put in a fixed version of 20 to 30 degrees, but that may not be correct. Those of us who use a arthroplasty should be aware that our prosthesis should have a restoration of posterior and lateral offset, which is part of the natural anatomy. And if your prosthesis doesn't have a posterior offset and lateral offset option, then we are unlikely to restore 3D anatomy. In fractures, it is often very difficult to evaluate a presence of axial nerve palsy and a rotator cuff status, which will also impact the outcome of these patients. However, the biggest bugbears of uh, hemiarthroplasty have been 11% GT complications, 7% proximal migrations later. Glenoid erosion, if you look at this patient uh, on the top, uh, this is one of our patients whom we've done a hemiarthroplasty nine years back. And you can see that there is a, sorry, there's a significant uh, medial migration here all the way down to the coracoid here. He has full function. And so it's very difficult for me to tell him to come in for a revision, though we are monitoring him closely. And whereas this is a 65 year old lady who's had it 13 years done and she has had no medial migration at all. So we don't quite understand this as yet, but that seems to be a consistent feature in the late hemiarthroplasties. But the lock plate or the phyllos plate is not without fault. The 
percentage of complications are rather high, 45% complication rate, 25% reoperations. But the most uh, sad part of the log plate is the 22% screw penetration of which 14% were on day one time zero and 8% happened later on. So the, this is not without fault. I think it was Pascal Boileau's paper which spoiled everything where he showed a 23% GT detachment and even some of them, even after they were correctly positioned. But one must understand that few of these papers about GT disruption were about elderly patients. And so we may not extrapolate the same to the younger patients because that would be different. I think Pascal's one conclusion was very pertinent that retroversion is very individual and not a fixed 20 degrees as near advised. One must be very careful of axillary nerve and I'm very concerned about the mid deltoid split approach. And if those of you who have not read the Westphal paper, Jan 2017, should go and read that because they had a 10% complication of axillary nerve uh, in all their deltoid split fractures. These are various uh, scenarios that can happen where in the top side, you see the GT is too proud and that's not going to have a good function at all. The second one, the GT was in position, underwent osteolysis later on. And the third one is pretty much what we would like to have into our patient where after repairing the GT, it should look like it belonged there as a snug fit. One knows that if the version is incorrect, then even with the first internal rotation, the GT will just split off and come off and that will lead to a disaster because without the GT healing, the results are pretty much uh, all or none. There are lots of complex devices to allow us to judge the height of the prosthesis. Uh, it becomes tedious and I don't believe in using them. I use a dedicated fracture stem. As you can see here, there are markings here. So I would do a trial reduction and ensure that on my trial, everything sits down as a snug fit. I can do a parachute closure and my, my ream has the same marking as my final prosthesis, which has a honeycomb appearance with a HA coat, which is only proximal HA coat, so that there's a friction fit between the GT, which wants to stay in there. And so never use a smooth uh, stem that you would use for osteoarthritis for a trauma situation. Uh, once I've finished my proximal humerus, uh, hemiarthroplasty. I want my entire parachute to close in an anatomical fashion with, in a tensionless manner, and I would do a rotational movement. This is one of the patients who's five years after a hemiarthroplasty, it's almost a full function. So unfortunately, we don't tend to get this in all of the patients, but we must endeavor to try. I think a lot of my practice changed after reading this uh, Mark Frankel paper on the circulage wiring, and I combined that with a knee snot and we published a paper on the knee knot being a superior knot than the standard surgical knot. Before we dwell on the literature on proximal humerus hemiarthroplasty, I would suggest that when there's an in-between case where you would, young patient, you would still like to preserve the head and reluctant to do a hemiarthroplasty. This is a bilboke prosthesis, which is now called as a just unique and helps us retain the normal anatomy and can be used uh, instead of replacing the head but you need to have very clear indications of when to use this. And I have this on the side table all the time. This is one of our patients. This is one year post-op. And then this one uh, on the top is the same lady, two years post-op. And you can see she has had an excellent result with the Just Unique. And so we've managed to preserve her head. She's 60, she's on the verge. Uh, I could have done a hemiarthroplasty, but here we have maintained her normal anatomy and uh, uh, we still have not burnt any bridges for a future correction if that was required. Now, this was our paper, uh, which was published in 2011. We had a reasonable result. The, our age group was fairly young. Uh, average age was 56. But if you look at Namdari's paper, who compared the hemiarthroplasty with uh, reverse shoulder replacement, there's hardly any difference between them if you took the young patients on hemiarthroplasty, and they had a higher complication in the reverse arthroplasty. Of course, the reverse is far better, superior, uh, has a, a faultless results, the movements are better, but it's a big job to do on a young patient. There are higher costs and infection rates are higher. However, both the hemi and the reverse would have results drop after 10 years in terms of clinical functions. Uh, 
before I finish off, I would like to touch base with the fact that if patients are above 75, I think we have a fair consensus on this, that we would prefer to do a reverse shoulder replacement in 80 years old patients uh, because of the osteoporosis and the lack of rotator cuff support on those patients. And they tend to do so well because we don't want to offer a revision surgery at that age. And all we want to do is a function restoration. The rotations are not as impressive as hemiarthroplasty, but their forward flexion abduction tends to be very impressive. So in conclusion, you need to choose between the whole basket of options between a uh, plate fixation, a just unique, a hemi, or a reverse. There is no one good answer. The biggest challenge is in those gray areas where you have a four-part fracture and a young patient who's 50 and you're torn between a fixation and a hemi. You could then jump into a just unique without compromising the head of the humerus. So finally, in conclusion, we must not forget the conservative option uh, because based on the proper study, we know that that has a reasonable good result, which is comparative to some of the fixation results. Anybody who can get the GT in position and get it to heal will win, whether it's a hemiarthroplasty or a reverse shoulder. The biggest dilemma is the young patient with complex fracture, fracture dislocation, four part. One must always choose a trauma prosthesis when you're doing a hemiarthroplasty but we are a great believer in native restoration function, uh, in native restoration of the version, because on our anatomical cadaveric study, our cadavers had uh, retroversion varying from 15 degrees to 50 degrees, and I'm loath to put in a fixed 20, 30 degree, because that would go wrong in half the patients. And we believe we can restore function because we use a native version on most of our patients. Certainly in about 70 patient, 70 year patients, I would definitely try to prefer a reverse shoulder arthroplasty rather than a hemi arthroplasty in those patients. Thank you very much for your attention. I conclude my talk here. Uh, thanks, thanks very much, Dr. Ashishin. We have uh, just the three minutes for discussion. So I will ask one question for each topic. First, I would like to ask to uh, Dr. Iman. Uh, my question is about the medial support the screw into inferomedial region of humeral head. Sometimes we call it long oblique screw. How do you think about the role of medial support screw? Do you usually try to insert this medial support screw during RIF? Thank you, Professor Kim. Yes, I think what you mean is uh, what we call the calcar screw. I always try to put the calcar screw because it is one of the best support to prevent from virus collapse. However, sometimes when we have uh, fractures in our population, we have a, a anatomical plate, which is designed from Caucasian people. When we put on the Asian people, sometimes it doesn't fit. So uh, my answer is I always try, but if it is not fit, then I don't put the calcar screw. As long as we have a good contact on the medial side, I think it will prevent from a virus collapse. Thank you, Dr. Heyman. Let's move to the second topic. Dr. Ashishi, I would like to ask one question. My question is about the version of the, of the humerus stem. How do you determine the version of the humerus stem? Right, Dr. Kim, I think that's an excellent question. And uh, judging when you're doing it for an elective case, uh, the surgeon is in control of doing the resection and he can do it at whichever version he chooses. But in trauma, because there's no reference, we still use two different points. Number one is the calcar or the uh, top of the shaft is never circumferential. It's a little oblong. And on the medial side, you can see that the two anterior and posterior cortexes merge. And so that tells you the medial most point of putting the processes in. And that corroborates very well with the medial epicondyle, which usually faces in the same direction of the head of humerus. So you have to tweak and put it in this position and then check a trial duction. On the trial, your GT and LT must sit together as if they belong there. And if you can get them to meet in the intertubercular group, I think collectively this confirms that you've got your version correct. It's very important to that because I'm a very big proponent of native version restoration. And I think it's different between the left and the right side and between different patients within themselves. 
Thank you, Dr. Ashishi. Uh, uh, due to time limitation, I'm going to end this session with a big hand to the two speakers who gave the great presentation. Thank you very much. Okay, we now go on to elbow section, uh, please. Hi, good evening, everyone. Hi, Sean. Um, um, <laughs> great. I'm Takuro Wada from Japan. I will moderate the lecture of Professor Sean Odrisko from Mayo Clinic. Sean is a famous elbow surgeon and a great teacher as well. Everybody knows him well and time is limited. So I'll skip the introduction to please refer the rhythm. Okay, the title of the lecture his lecture is Principle of Management of the Cell Humeral Fracture, as simple to complex. Sean, please start your lecture. Arigato, Taka. Thank you very much. It's very nice, real pleasure to be here with you. I appreciate uh, what everybody has done to organize this conference. And um, I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. I wanna make sure I have my clock so I stay on time. Um, can you hear me okay? And can you see my slides okay? Good. Yes, wonderful. Okay, very good. Now I have some disclosures because uh, I designed some plates and screws that Acumed makes for distal humerus fractures and uh, joint replacement for the elbow that Tornier makes, a splint that Aircast makes, and money goes to Mayo Clinic, and I receive some royalties from that. But um, th those things won't influence what I have to say in teaching you today about this. I have um, two main goals. The first goal would be to go through the priorities that should be in order of priority that you have as your goals when you treat a patient with a distal humerus fracture. There are six of them. And the second goal that I have is to uh, go through uh, the principal basis on which we treat the distal humerus itself. So the goals in order of priority are to prevent infection, to obtain soft tissue closure, to restore the diaphysis and metaphysis, <coughs> pardon me, to restore the articular surface. There we are there. That's something went wrong on my slide there. Pardon me. Not sure what happened there. Oh, there we are. Um, to restore the articular surface, to maintain articular congruence, and then to maintain joint motion. So for example, if you could not maintain articular congruence, then you should not try to move the elbow. You should keep the elbow still while maintaining articular congruence. So the order of these priorities takes precedent. Number one is more important than number two, the more important than number four is more important than number six and so on. Very, very worthwhile to keep those in mind. The second, um, goal that I have is to go through and address what I seem to think are the top 10 questions that people have about distal humerus fractures. And because time is short, we'll try to go through these fairly succinctly, fairly clearly, without losing a lot of time at all. First, surgical approach and what to do with the ulnar nerve. I think most surgeons would agree that a um, olecranon osteotomy gives you the best exposure and most surgeons need the best exposure to treat these distal humerus fractures well. So I recommend an olecranon osteotomy. What to do with the ulnar nerve has become controversial because uh, recent studies have suggested that there's not a benefit to transposing the nerve. Indeed, there are some disadvantages. Here are my recommendations from personal experience. If the nerve is touching a plate when you're finished the operation, particularly if the nerve is touching a titanium plate, the likelihood of scarring around the nerve becoming a problem and leading to problems later on is such that I would recommend transposing the nerve. On the other hand, when you transpose a nerve, you create a flap and those skin flaps create problems with hematoma, wound infection, risk, and so on. So it's still a little bit controversial. And I think that we can answer the question, <clears throat> pardon, we can answer the question in the future with a perhaps a little bit more refined study of that issue. So it still is a little bit up for discussion, that one. 
Next, why or how does open reduction internal fixation fail? Well, it's very clear that it fails because of inadequate fixation in the distal humerus and non-unions typically occur at the supracondylar level because of this. And the reasons have to do with how we use our arms and the biomechanics. We look at an X-ray of the elbow uh, such as this and we use our elbows like this. So in reality, we should probably turn the X-ray sideways to understand the various gravitational load on the lateral column of the elbow. And this gravitational lateral column load in varus is what pulls the lateral column away from a plate if you put the plate on the back of the lateral column, which brings us to the idea of how to optimize fixation using parallel rather than 1990 plates on the distal humerus. And it has become very clearly established in the last 20 years now that, that parallel plate fixation is at least as good uh, or superior to perpendicular plate fixation. Now, to prevent this failure of fixation, we have to satisfy two principles. The first principle is that we must maximize or optimize fixation of the distal fragments, because that's where failure occurs. And secondly, all fixation in the distal fragments should contribute to supracondylar stability because the fixation in the distal fragments is the limiting factor when we fix these. So from those two principles, we then derive a list of technical objectives. These are not how you do the surgery, but these are technical objectives that when you're finished the surgery, you can go through this list of seven objectives and check each one off. And they are as follows regarding the screws in the distal fragments. First, each screw in the distal fragment should pass through a plate, makes it much more efficient. It should be anchored in a fragment that is also fixed by a plate on the other side of the humerus. It should be as long as possible. It should engage as many fragments as possible. And the screws and the distal fragments should interdigitate and lock together so they link the columns together. The plates should be applied with compression at the supracondylar level. And we'll talk about how to do that if there's comminution. And they should be stiff and strong enough so they don't bake, uh, break or bend while you're waiting for healing to occur. This is technical objective um, number six, or in this list here where I've actually reduced the list by one number, it becomes number five, but the number doesn't matter. But um, we see that the screws and the distal fragments here should lock together. And that way they link the two columns together and create a fixed structure out of the metal work that's in the bone. And this is a basic architectural or engineering principle that um, dramatically, dramatically improves the stability of the fixation. So um, from these technical objectives, which we derive from principles, we then develop a list of steps that we do in surgery. And there are five steps in the surgery. The first is articular reduction, in which we reduce the fragments, hold them together with some smooth pins temporarily. The second step is plate fixation. And uh, so plate fixation and provisional, sorry, plate application and provisional fixation. And during this stage, we want to pass two pins through the holes in the epicondyles. So these holes right at the epicondyles, we wanna pass two millimeter pins in there and leave those there until late in the surgery. It's like they have a, a reserved sign. They are reserved for later placement of a screw because with those pins in place, they function like a drill bit. They have, they made a hole for a screw, but it's easy to then drill around those pins and put a screw in, in step three, step three is distal fixation. So we can put these screws in distally around those pins without worrying about hitting another screw. And then later, once those screws are in, when we take the pins out, we'll be able to advance a screw because the hole is already there. So step three is distal fixation. Step four is supracondylar compression. So we loosen the screw on one side, the screw that's in the slotted hole, and then we compress with a large tenaculum. We drill eccentrically with a dynamic compression screw on that one side as well. And then we turn it around and do the same thing on the other side and obtain supracondylar compression. Then we remove all the pins and put the remaining screws in place. And we have a parallel concept here. 
So there have been a number of studies, and this is one good one because they both uh, both groups were treated with locking plates, which is current technology. One system, uh, the uh, Synthy system of parallel, I'm sorry, of perpendicular plates with locking screws. The other system being the Acumed system of parallel plate configuration. That was the one that I um, had designed. Um, and so that's where the conflict comes in. I'm sorry, my, my screen is doing something a little bit automatic here, I'm not sure what. And, um, and they found that the um, parallel plate arrangement was stiffer, and um, uh, this was in both in axial compression and an external rotation. So no study has shown that perpendicular plate fixation is better. Every study has shown that parallel plate fixation is better or that there's no difference in terms of biomechanical strength. Question number six, how to fix the coronal shear component? And this is a difficult one. Um, this, is a, this is a situation that causes a lot of confusion, especially in teaching, because some of my colleagues teach that the coronal shear component is a good reason to put the lateral plate posteriorly on the lateral column. <clears throat> I would disagree that coronal shear component is a good reason to use sagittal plate arrangement. I'm gonna show you that right now. Now, to explain how to do the coronal shear component, I want to first show you a coronal shear fracture fixed using the same principles, but this fracture is not a whole distal humerus fracture. This is just a coronal shear fracture that's quite bad. So here we have a coronal shear fracture on the left. Uh, here we see it fixed on the right. Notice that the medial column is intact. So this is not a so-called distal humerus fracture. Um, with both columns involved. This is just a coronal shear. But next, we're going to fix one that has a coronal shear and both columns. I want you to understand how to do this. So the first step is to put a screw from medial to lateral through the intact medial bone, right here, through the intact medial bone into this piece of bone that we call the coronal shear component. You see, these are the screw tips right here at the front over on your right. They're going very anteriorly into this bone that is the coronal shear component. Then we want to lock those two screws in place with two screws coming through from the lateral side through a plate, interdigitating with those screws inside the distal humerus and lock them in position. And then finally, we want to lock the uh, whole construct together using one or two screws coming from the back to the front. So let's now do the same thing with a distal humerus. So here, this is a bad fracture in a surgeon, severe comminution of the lateral column of the distal humerus, there's a coronal shear component, even the medial column is comminuted. So how are we going to fix this? Well, we're gonna use the same two principles. Remember the two principles, what are they? They are that all the fixation in the, sorry, that, that we must maximize fixation in the distal fragments and that all fixation in the distal fragments should contribute to superconvex stability. We're gonna achieve all seven of those objectives. And then we're gonna go through the five steps. So let's see if we can do that. Here's what it looks like when we're finished. And how did we get there? Well, let's focus on the coronal shear component. The coronal shear component involves two screws going from medial to lateral into the coronal shear portion over here anteriorly on the lateral side. You see, that's where these screws come. But because this is a distal humerus fracture, these screws have to go through a plate. Remember, um, technical objective number one, all the screws going through the distal humerus should go through a plate. Then we bring two screws also through plates from the lateral side to the medial side and interdigitate with those to lock them in place. Then we bring two screws from back to front in the third dimension and lock them in place in the third dimension. So now we have the coronal shear component completely rigidly fixed. And we put in the rest of the screws and we've satisfied all of the principles. All of the principles because these screws all contribute to superconvex stability. They're all linked together to the shaft. We've optimized or maximized fixation in the distal fragments. Objective number one, all screws go through a plate distally, except these two here, but they were for locking the other ones together. Um, the screws go through a plate into a fragment on the other side of the elbow, on the other side of distal humerus that is also fixed by a plate. That's number two. They're as long as possible. Um, they engage as many fragments as possible. 
and they're interdigitated. And finally, these plates are strong and stiff and they're applied with compression at super conway level. So we applied all of those objectives and accomplished those, uh, those objectives. How do we deal with bone loss in the super conway region? Well, in the super conway region, you have several options, but the best one we think is a super conway osteectomy and shortening or SOS procedure for short. So you start by reducing the articular segments with pins and then you realize you're missing bone. So what you do is you trim the shaft so that the distal segment will fit onto the shaft with end to end compression on both sides and side to side on one of the sides. Then you do everything as we just did with the other ones. You do plate uh, application and provisional fixation then distal fixation with one screw from either side, leaving those pins in place. Step four is compression at the super conlar level, first on the lateral side, and then put in a dynamic compression screw. And then on the medial side, and compress there against the super conlar region there. You see how you've got bone to bone compression. And then you take out the pins and put in the remaining screws. Finally, because you have shortened it, you need to recreate the olecranon fossa as well. And if you're wondering about the coronoid fossa, the way you recreate that is to prevent the coronoid fossa from being obliterated by shifting the whole distal humerus a little bit anteriorly when you reduce it. Here's an example of a very bad fracture. Uh, he's missing the middle trochlea, the lateral trochlea, and four centimeters of the lateral column. So we brought this spike of bone here that has the brachioradialis muscle origin on it <coughs> down and interposed it between the capitellum and the shaft. Here you see it in here and compressed that between the two. We shortened the humerus and obtained 1.4 millimeters of 1.4 centimeters of overlap on the medial side with, uh, with side to side compression and then compressed everything against that. And we have rigid, this is a 3.5 LCDC plate. This was before we had the pre-contrary plates. And, um, and here he is uh, two years later, that's his dominant arm. This was an open fracture, of course, and he did very well. So you can see that, that the principles are all applied and um, we are able to achieve a very good result with that. How do you fix the olecranon osteotomy? I recommend that you use this Harris wire knot tightener. I looked this up on the internet. There's the internet page when I looked it up some time ago. I don't have anything to do with this implant. Uh, it was designed by R.I. Harris, a Canadian surgeon. Uh, very, very effective for tying the maximum tension in the wire and the lowest profile knot. So I really, really like it. Anyone who's seen me use it uh, has uh, been convinced that that's a good way to go. Post-op management involves putting the arm out straight with a padded Jones bandage on, plaster on the front of the arm with the elbow extended to how far it will go with gravity and leave that on for at least five days if they have an open wound, leave it on until the open wound is healed, but it will dramatically improve uh, the condition of the elbow with respect to hematoma and wound healing problems such as flat fracture blisters and so on on the back. Put the arm up in the air and raise it, but bring it down for at least five minutes each hour so they don't get a compartment syndrome. Finally, how to manage wound dehiscence and problems on the back of the elbow, because sometimes these will occur. Here's an example of a man who came to me with this fracture. It's not a distal humerus, it's a proximal ulna, but it, it tells you the same uh, principles. And he was uh, infected nine days after uh, he was treated. Uh, he came in, we treated the infection. Uh, he dehissed his wound. And now at five weeks post revision, he has a wound dehiscence. It's draining strep, infected with strep and pseudomonas and mycobacterium. So we debride that, put on a wound vac, use that for five weeks and then start treating the wound with Dakin solution, 0.025% Dakin solution, wet to dry dressings every day. This is what the wound looks like six months later. It's a clean contaminated wound. It sits there uh, in harmony with the rest of the body. And then once the bone is healed on a CT scan, take the plate out, elevate the flaps and close the flaps and it heals very nicely. Very predictable way for managing these wounds. I do not let the plastic surgeons do a flap on these. So in summary, we've looked at the 10, the top 10 questions for avoiding failures and complications, going through them step by step. And we've tried to focus on what the priorities in elbow fractures are. Uh, some of you will get some very severe ones where, for example, it's not possible to maintain motion. 
it might not be possible to maintain articular congruence even, in which case you just want to restore whatever articular structures that you can get, make sure you restore the diaphysis and the metaphysis, span the entire thing with a rigid external fixator for two to four months while everything heals together and becomes scarred together, make sure you prevent infection, get soft tissue closure. And when you're all finished and you've accomplished the first four goals, then you see what happens in terms of mobility and stability of the elbow and see if you can do something further with it. But this is the overall list of goals in order of priority, whether you practice at the Mayo Clinic or whether you practice in the jungle uh, or in the forest somewhere in a, uh, in a in an underdeveloped country that has few uh, resources. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. I should let you know that um, we, uh, well, we just decided this week that the course that we run every year, the Teach the Teachers course in June, is going to be virtual again next year. We had a virtual course this year and it was spectacular. It was, um, it was uh, really just, I think, amazingly uh, well received. We're gonna be putting on, we think, um, a terrific course next year as well, June 10th to 12th. So uh, send me a note. I should have put my email address up there, but you can find it through anybody here and send me a note and we'll be, uh, I'm sure that we'll be putting one on that you'll be very glad to, to, to be at. So just for our, our Korean host, Kam Samada, and uh, Dr. Taka, Arigato uh, I'm glad to answer any questions. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sean. Well organized lecture. Very easy to understand. Very good, great lecture. Uh, several questions from the audience. I'll pick up some. Um, one question is on. Uh, uh, one question is that a uh, timing of on our nerve exp for explosion when the uh, patient had a on a nerve irritation or a, on a palsy after surgery? Yes, yeah. Yeah, that, that's a good question. So if the, it depends on whether or not the nerve had been transposed. So if the nerve was not transposed and the patient has any alder nerve symptoms at all, the next question to ask is, are they having trouble getting their motion back? Because if so, they almost for certain have a neurogenic contracture. And then the next question is, have they formed some HO, some heterotopic ossification near the nerve? And you must do a CT scan to answer that question. So let's say you see the patient back at eight weeks post-op, their motion is um, 50 to 95 degrees of motion. Uh, the surgery went well, technically, it looks good on X-ray. They've got some alder nerve symptoms. You did not transpose the nerve to me. That patient has a neurogenic contracture. And if you do a CT scan, you'll see some heterotopic ossification near the ulnar nerve, in which case the optimum timing to treat that is probably right away, next week or the week after. No point in waiting whatsoever on that. You should transpose the nerve, do a neurolysis, transpose the nerve. And um, whether you do a contracture release at the same time as treating the nerve is um, not completely sure. Um, currently, I somewhat favor doing a transposition of the nerve, let the nerve settle down, and don't do anything else. Give it one month to three months or four, and then go in arthroscopically and do a contracture release. So you separate out the two problems and the two objectives and the two completely different rehabilitation programs. Prioritizing the nerve to be allowed to get better. Because an irritated nerve in a contracted elbow will always dominate and cause loss of, loss of motion. Thank you. Another question is, uh, uh, do you have the uh, experience of aseptic necrosis due to the overcrowded screws? In the no. Mm. no, I have never seen that. Um, I've never seen any evidence of that whatsoever. I think that that is um, probably a very uncommon thing. We used to use, in the beginning, the screws that I put in, like that old picture I showed you before the contoured plates were available, those were 3.5 cortical screws. Those are really big. Now we have 3.0, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5, 3.5,
2.7 or even smaller ones. So, um, and I used to put six screws in, three from each side. Now I just put two from each side. I don't think you need six. I think you need just four. So, but even when I was putting six 3.5 screws, I never saw any evidence of a vascular necrosis. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, okay. time is running out. Okay, thank you very much, Sean. Great, Welcome to Tash Mash Day. Okay, very good. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much. And I'll go on to the resection now. Margaret Ford, would you like to take over, please? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ted. So, um, so it's great honor that we'll go into the, the hand section. So first we'll have um, Dr. Esther Chow, who is the, um, who's going to talk about the controversies of um, how to manage um, undisplaced skateboard fractures. She is the, um, she's a long-term friend. She's the secretary of the Hong Kong Society of Surgery of the Hand. And she's uh, associate consultant of the United Christian Hospital in Hong Kong. She's also honorary assistant professor of the Department of Orthopedics and Traumatology University of Hong Kong. She is currently the scientific committee member of the APOA Hand and Upper Limb Society. And she's also in the education committee of Asia Pacific Risk Association. Esther, please. So um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Today, I'm going to talk about the controversies in the displaced scaphoid fracture management. And I hope that at the end of my presentation, you will be convinced by me that conservative treatment is a better option. So scaphoid fracture is the most common carpal fractures. And the indications for surgery include the following, perilunate fracture dislocation, displaced or comminuted fracture, um, established non-union, and proximal pole fracture. But today we are going to talk about the type B2 fracture, which is undisplaced, meaning which is less than one millimeter step or gap. Whether to treat this conservatively or surgically is controversial. Conservative treatment meanings are cast immobilization, whether using a long arm or short arm cast with or without thumb immobilization. According to the system meta review, um, there is insufficient evidence to confirm which type of cast is superior. How about surgical treatment? The current trend is by using a percutaneous screw fixation, either in a retrograde or anti-grade manner. And the obvious benefit is earlier return to work and earlier return to sports. And Dr. Jeff Ecker will further elaborate this um, in his lecture. So whether to treat conservatively or surgically, what is your choice? So let's take a look at this scenario. So if one day you had a surgery, you had a fall injury and sustained an undisplaced scaphoid fracture in your dominant hand, what would you choose? Will you choose conservative treatment or percutaneous screw fixation? So I asked this question by sending a questionnaire to a hundred healthcare workers and ask them if they sustain such a fracture, what would they choose? And there are 56 respondents and 66.1% respond that they will choose surgical treatment while 32% will choose conservative treatment. So I further analyzed the factors to see which factor actually will um, contribute to the uh, treatment options. So concerning the age, age is not a significant factor that affect the treatment of choice. Gender is also not affecting the treatment of choice. For occupation, there's no significant um, contributing factor that um, affect the treatment of choice. But interestingly, when I further stratify the occupations into male and female, I found that male orthopedic non-hand surgeons preferred surgical treatment, while female hand surgeons prefer conservative treatment. Whether you are active in sports seems there's no affecting the treatment options. And whether you're actively playing any musical instrument also is not a significant factor that affect the treatment options. So is there any evidence to support screw fixation or conservative treatment 
So a systematic review in 2016 shows that screw fixation has a faster return to work and shorter time to union, but conservative treatment has a lower complication rate. Another meta-analysis in 2018 shows that screw fixation has a faster return to work and shorter time to union, but concerning the function, range of motion and complication, there's not much difference. So the conclusion of these two systematic reviews is that evidence is insufficient to conclude that surgery is a better option. Let's take a look at more studies. Concerning the return to work, surgery has a faster return to work at six weeks, while conservative treatment um, takes 11.5 weeks. Range of motion at eight to 16 weeks, screw fixation has a better range of motion. But after that, there's no difference, or even there's a better range of motion in the conservative treatment group. For grip strength, from eight to 16 weeks, screw fixation has a better strength, but after 16 weeks, there's no difference. Similarly, for function score, at eight to 12 weeks, the function score is better in the surgical group, but after a year, there's no difference. For the time to union, it seems that screw fixation has a better time to union at 7.4 weeks. However, it is just 2.8 weeks difference. And this is also related to whether you um, look at it at a CT scan or you look at it at just um, radiographs. For non-union rate, there's no difference between the two groups. For the complication rate, conservative treatment has a much lower complication rate. And more importantly is that surgical complications are usually more serious and I will further, further um, get it, uh, elaborate on this. Concerning arthritis, conservative treatment has a much lower risk of arthritis. So radiation exposure is a major drawback of surgical treatment because it is not uncommon that you need to take quite a lot of x-rays in order to put in a screw in a good position. Concerning the cost, um, conservative treatment, the cost for the um, direct cost, which is the cast, is 650 US dollars. And for screw fixation, the cost is 7,500 US dollars. So concerning the indirect cost, which is the salary of the patient absent from work. And if you add these two costs together, screw fixation is much more expensive. For surgical complications, it can be classified into implant-related complications, tendon, nerve, and vascular injuries. Implant-related complications include broken drill bits, uh, guide pins, or other broken implants, and also protrusion of screw. Either the screw head or even the screw tips can be protruded out. And this one study shows that actually these complications are not uncommon there's up to 12.5% of screw infringement or protrusion, and 8% of cases has implant breakage. For tendon injury, if you go to the Vola approach, rupture of the FCR tendon has been reported by a protruded screw head, and FCR tendon injury has been reported as high as 27% of cases. On the dorsal approach, there's 12.5% risk of injury to the extensor tendons. Nerve injury is also reported with one case of compression of the median nerve by the screw being misplaced volarly. For vascular injury, if you go to the volar approach, the superficial palmar branch of the radial artery is at risk. So I will um, show you a, a real example a 28 years old gentleman, right-handed IT worker, come to my clinic and he sustained a right scaphoid fracture, undisplaced. So I ask, do you want surgery? You can return to work early, but there are risks of surgery. And he replied, no, doctor, please just give me a cast. So he explained that that was what happened to him two years ago on the other side. So there's um protrusion of screw and complications. And therefore, for this time on his right hand, he chose conservative treatment. And at eight weeks, the fracture healed well and he is happy. So in conclusion, for undisplayed scaphoid fracture, surgical treatment 
has a faster return to work at six weeks. Concerning the range of motion and grip strength, it seems that there's not much in, um, benefit for surgical treatment, only in the early post-operative period. Um, union rate seven weeks versus 10 weeks, I think there's not much um, um, benefit for surgical treatment. But conservative treatment has no radiation, no surgical complications, and a much lower rate of arthritis in the long run. So I think conservative treatment is a better option for this type of um, scaphoid fracture. So thank you very much. And may I um, invite all of you to join the um, Hong Kong International Risk of Frostway webshop and webinar, which will be held three weeks later. And you can scan the QR code for more details. And thank you very much. Thank you, Esther. So now it's up to Jeff, our hand and wrist surgeon from Perth, Australia, to talk about, um, to rebut about why we need to treat it with surgical treatment. So Jeff is the president of Australia Hand Society um, um, and is He's also the vice president of the Asia Pacific Risk Association. And he's the immediate past president of the West Australian Hand Surgery Society. He is a junk professor at the Curtin University of School of Medicine and the director of Hand and Upper Limb Center in Western Australia. So Jeff, please. Thank you. Can you see my slides now? Yes. Um, I've been asked to talk to you about operative treatment of undisplaced capoid fractures, the controversy. Oh. Um, I think in 2019, uh, a young surgeon, Bo Lu, who's current chairperson of the Asia Pacific Wrist Association, said something that really crystallized. He said, don't tell me what's in the literature, I can read. So when we look at an undisplaced scaphoid fracture, we're actually looking at a frozen moment in time. Our CT scan does not give us information about the stability of the fracture, the stability of the carpus, whether or not there's a perilunate ligament injury and if or not it involves the distal radio ulna joint. You have no idea about the displacement of that fracture and that risk at the time of the injury. Furthermore, the definition of undisplaced fractures of the scaphoid is unclear. So we're having a controversy about whether or not we splint, treat, or treat conservatively, or operate on a condition which is not clearly defined. So we're creating a maelstrom. We're creating confusion. So we come to use the term undisplaced as being synonymous for a fracture that can be treated non-operatively. But if we look at the literature, this may be less than one millimeter displacement less than 1.5 millimeter displacement, less than two millimeter displacement. These are displaced fractures. They're either undisplaced or displaced. So the importance of a full information base when you're deciding whether or not to treat an undisplaced fracture non-operatively or operatively. We all forget about clinical examination. We focus on x-rays and CT scans. But if you see somebody acutely and they've got wrist swelling, perilunate tenderness, DAUJ pain and instability, there's gonna be a lot more going on than a simple undisplaced fracture. And you will need to examine that wrist arthroscopically to understand the full extent of that injury. So I prefer treatment for so-called undisplaced scaphoid fractures you only deviate the wrist to extend the scaphoid. You then dorsiflex and supinate to reduce the scaphoid and gain access for your wires and your screws. And here you can see an anti-rotation wire 
and a sprue being inserted into the scaphoid. Now this can be done under local anesthetic and very quickly. Here's one without an anti-rotation K-wire. K-wire is inserted and we're using a power screwdriver simply to put the screw in. This is interesting. Watch how this carpus reduces as the scaphoid is fixed and the proximal pole is compressed on the distal pole. The image intensifier can be misleading. If there's any doubt, use the scope. Here you can see a wire protruding through the proximal pole of the scaphoid. You can withdraw it and look inside. One day post-surgery, you can start moving. They wear a splint for six weeks, a lightweight removable splint but you can start supervised movement. Now this is case selection. Obviously, if you have a perilunate ligament injury or a distal radial joint triangular fibro cartilage injury, you would not move them this way. So an undisplaced scaphoid fracture that I would consider managing in a splint. There is pain over the scaphoid, no swelling. The CT shows an undisplaced scaphoid. It's an adolescent with open growth plates. The importance of clinical examination, no perilunate tenderness, no swelling, just tenderness over the scaphoid. Treated in a splint and as you'd expect, as Esther's told us, they unite very well. Now this is what I would call a true undisplaced fracture of the scaphoid. This is an accurate use of the term. No risk swelling, pain over the scaphoid, and you cannot see a fracture on the CT scan. But if we do an MRI scan, we can see a microtrabecular bruise focused on the scaphoid and to a much lesser extent on the lunate and the capitate. So his sports physician says to him, you can play football. So three weeks later, he hits a football and he presents with severe wrist pain and marked swelling. And now he has a transscaphoid perilunate fracture subluxation. And you can see just how unstable that is. That's that microtrabecular fracture that is literally broken with a relatively minor contact. The trick here is just to fix the lunate, the mid-carpal joint, and you can use the same technique. You fix the lunate, it becomes quite straightforward. Four months later, he heals. So we still have a controversy. We have a microtrabecular fracture, truly, truly undisplaced. And there still is a case for internal fixation. It's a choice that the patient makes with the surgeon. There's a risk benefit ratio. And I'll put to you, if you have an elite athlete who is going to play in a grand final in four to six weeks of the microtrabecular fracture, there is a case to insert a screw. So look at this case. Swollen perilunate tenderness, distal radio ulnar joint laxity and pain. And if you look at that scaphoid, it's a proximal pole. There's no doubt, no controversy that needs to be fixed. And you would say, yes, it's undisplaced. But if you look carefully, you can see a lucency at the fracture site and a minuscule avulsion fracture. You've got to look very, very carefully. So, you know, you're thinking, we just got to make a cut on the back of the wrist, the dorsum of the wrist, drop a wire down and screw it. But I'm uncertain. We already know we already know that it's swollen and there's a major wrist ligament injury. So should we use a scope? The answer is, I think yes, because it's about examination and information. And here you can see what appears to be unstable, a very unstable scaphoid. And furthermore, scaphoid instability. And to add to it a positive hook test with an intact foveal insertion and distal radial joint instability. The foveal insertion was intact. I can't show you that. We haven't got time. So because we know the anatomy, we can do a dorsal distal peripheral repair of the triangular fibre cartilage and know we're going to get a good result. Then reduce the scaphoid. And here's the trick. You must see the wires come through the scaphoid because you cannot rely on the II, the fluoroscopy. You have to see the wires penetrate and then check that your fixation is solid. And that fixation in the scaphoid is not good enough without a radiolunate wire to hold the lunate and stabilize the proximal, proximal carpal row and the mid-carpal joint. But we still have a problem. 
We've got a radiolunar K wire neutralizing our scaphoid fixation, but we still have scaphoid instability. So it's six weeks. Here you can see the X-ray on CT scan, it's united. Take the wires out, the proximal pole is stable. And then we can do an arthroscopic dorsal capsulodesis, passing a suture over the scaphoid, then over the lunate. Using a dry technique, you get a tremendous view. And then getting a really good grasp on the dorsal capsule to close the dorsal ligaments over the scaphoid and the lunate. So in conclusion, <coughs> we need more definition and clarity about what constitutes an undisplaced scaphoid fracture. We need to know whether there's an associated instability of the scaphoid or the wrist, the ligaments, and the DRUJ. We need to go back to basics and examine wrists, not just rely on an X-ray and a CT scan. The 1.9 millimeter arthroscope used dry is an excellent diagnostic tool. It gives you more information than an MRI or a CT scan. And once you know what you've got, it becomes a therapeutic tool. And of course, as Esther said, if you don't know how to do the surgery, you're gonna have some complications. And I think a lot of the criticism of open surgery is on big series without people that are well-trained to know what they're doing. So we need a full information base and we must never forget that the scaphoid is part of the whole risk. There's a choice and a decision to be made about surgery. There's a risk benefit ratio. It's what the patient needs and it's the expertise of the surgeon, the experience of the surgeon, and the facilities that are available. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Esther. So um, we just have some questions to ask. So we'll start with Esther. So I'm just wondering, for your conservative treatment, um, when, to ask, when do you ask the patients to come back? So... Um... I would check the x-ray at two weeks yeah. and then um, see if there's any displacement. If there's no displacement, then I will continue the cast for another four weeks. So we'll come back at six weeks, take off the cast and then um, check the x-ray or screening under um, uh, fluoroscopy and see if there's a union. Okay. And then um, after that, uh, I'll probably, if there's some, um, um, examine the wrist, any um, persistent pain. If there is no persistent pain um, and um, radiologically there's union, then I will take off everything. And if in doubt, I'll give um, the patient um, some spiker splint for another um, two to three weeks and then come back to check again. Okay. So when would you consider surgery? Because there is a risk of having a non-union um, right? So when would you decide to think about, to ask the patient to switch, come. switching from conservative to surgery. Yes. Surgery. So first, if there's undisplaced um, fracture, I mean, if at two weeks I can see there's some um, displaced fracture or there's any signs of like um, SL ligaments injury or other um, wrist um, pain, like um, ulnar wrist pain, which may um, su suggestive of um, TFCC injury. And um, I think um, if there's no displacement, no other ligamentous injuries, um, I would just keep the cast. And if in doubt, I would um, do a CT scan to confirm the healing. Okay. So at, for example, at six weeks, you still, the patients still have a little bit of pain. There's no displacement. Um, and you're not, so you, you arrange the CT. So you'll, and then you'll thumb spiker for another few weeks and then see. If there's no obvious gap in the fracture lab, in, in the x-ray, then I will um, do a, maybe do a CT scan. If there's some um, like early signs of non-union, I'll probably put in um, arthroscopy. Okay. Because um, for these type of like delayed um, or subacute um, fracture, if under the arthroscope, the fracture is very stable then probably I would just leave it and continue immobilization. Okay, yeah, thank you. Um, next, Jeff. Um, so you talk about that there's undisplaced fractures that um, if it's really undisplaced, there's just mild tenderness at the scaphoid, you would cast them. 
So when would you start thinking about surgery? Oh, I think that or the, or the any, like, yeah. any, any displaced fracture yeah. is an indication for surgery for me. And, yeah. um, you know, we, we do a lot of surgery and our complication rates are very, very low. And it means you can mobilize, you know what you're dealing with. There's a lot of problems with non-operative treatment we don't talk about. One is pain is not an index of whether or not the fracture is healed. Two, an X-ray is notoriously unreliable at six weeks. Three, even a CT can give you a false positive. You can have an established non-union with a trabecular bone, grinding of the trabecular bone, and you can think it's united. And unless you scope it, you will not know. So there's, there's for me, any displaced fracture, and if there's any perilunate swelling, any DRUJ swelling, absolutely. And I think your CT is the most important test because one of the things that people get stuck with is when they when they try to fix an acute on chronic, you know, somebody's had an asymptomatic chronic non-union, they fall over, you get a CT, you know it's sclerotic, it needs a bone graft, it needs to be cut out and done properly. Drop a screw and it won't work. So I, I um, the, I've told you what I think needs to be treated non-operatively, the rest needs to be treated surgically. And I think the most important thing is a clinical diagnosis. Examine the wrist and don't forget your arthroscope is an excellent way to examine the wrist as well. So do you do wrist arthroscopy for all patients who you treat? Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. And the reason for that is that a wrist arthroscopy is like 90 seconds when you know how to do it once it's all set up and you get an amazing amount of additional information. It is possible to fix the scaphoid and not fix it solidly. You can put a scope in there and you can see the thing move. I mean, you can see all the other injuries that are present. And uh, for me, uh, it is just, you know, there's so many things you don't see on an X-ray. There's so many things you don't see on a CT or an MRI and it all adds up. Now, this is really pushing the boundary. This topic was controversial, but yeah. this is the way that I practice. Now, we measure everything. We get 70 to 80% retrieval on all our patients, three, six, 12 months. We've got 13 terabytes of hard drive uh, material. So we know what we can get. We know what our complication rates are, and we know what our risk-benefit ratio is. So I don't have a problem with operating at all. Mm -hmm. And I can see that you do um, bola. You tend to do bola approach for waste. I mean, we're talking undisplaced waste fracture. So you do bola approach. You do the um, you do you do from ritual grade. Do you ever do um, dorsal approach? Do you do the 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 NC grade? I, I used to do that all the time, and I think I showed you that case where it was just so tempting to go dorsal, but then you cut the ligaments. You cut the ligaments. You cut the nerves. You destabilize. You don't leave a small footprint. There is damage with your approach. And I think arthroscopically, I showed you a video of how you've got to watch the wires go through the fracture. Once you do that, then you know you're going to fix the proximal pole. So over the last five years, my tendency has been to go distal to proximal, even for the small proximal pole. And I think the small proximal pole is the case that you do arthroscopically from distal to proximal. And it takes time to learn. Okay, thank you. Um, I think we are just about time. Any other questions from the floor that you would like to ask? No. Um, okay, then, um, yeah, then we are just, we, I think we're just on time. Um, so maybe, um, so thank you, Jeff, and thank you, Esther. I think if we have a, if you have a fracture of this of a scaphoid and you need surgery, you can go for, to Jeff who have lots of experience in doing a in doing a um, a percutaneous screw fixation with with low complication rate. And yeah, and so yeah, and with that, um, thank you, and I pass it on to Ted. Well, thank you so much, Margaret. It uh, it has been uh, very informative uh, in our inaugural Panoplim uh, webinar tonight. I have learned quite a few tricks and I hope you have too. I'd like to thank all the speakers and moderators, as well as our sponsors tonight, Smith and Nephew Asia Pacific. I also like to thank Otto TV, Panoplim committee members, Jamal Ashraf, the Secretary General of APOA and the APO Secretary in Kuala Lumpur for making this webinar possible. For the participants, uh, we will send you a quick survey for you to complete and return.
And upon receiving your uh, survey, we will then send out the uh, certificate of attendance to you uh, in due course. Uh, finally, I'd like to introduce Professor Kim Munsang, who is going to tell us about the second webinar uh, in January. Uh, Munsang, would you like to run through the second webinar, please? Okay. Uh, would you open the slide? Okay, hi everyone. Uh, first of all, I hope today's webinar was helpful to you. Uh, let me introduce you the schedule of the second webinar, which will be held on January 31st next year, Sunday, 3 p.m. Kuala Lumpur time. Uh, next slide. The theme of the second webinar is arthroscopy and sports-related injury in shoulder and elbow and wrist. We are going to deal with the perinunate fracture dislocation and lateral epicondylitis and shoulder instability with five outstanding speakers and three moderators. Please give us a lot of support and interest at the upcoming second webinar on January 31st next year. See you at the next webinar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Munsang. And to that, uh, from uh, Hannah Blim Society of APOA, I'd like to thank all of you for participating tonight. I know it's been late in some country, including Australia myself, uh, and it has been informative and very, um, uh, very useful for, I'm sure, some of the especially trainees. Uh, to that, I'll say good night to all of you and look forward to catching with you again after New Year. Stay safe and we'll touch base soon. Thank you so much. Bye now. Thank you.